Welcome to you guys who are coming in um, for our webinar. We'll just wait for everyone to join. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Exciting. It's lovely to see all our customers um, joining in here. So we have a few attendees now. Um, I'm going to play a little introduction which is a video of the La Brucesca estate um, to warm us all up for our Italian extravaganza this morning. So hopefully this works. Uh, let me try. Um, there we go. Apologies, I realized there might well have been no sound there. There was actually very good music. Uh, and that would be the joy of um, the joys of computers. So apologies for that. Um, at the end, I'll replay it and get the sound sorted while we're talking. Um, so I'm going to move away from that one. There we go. Um, and say good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning into our webinar. Love the fact the first technical issue has uh, already happened. Um, I'm Harriet Tyndall of Tyndall Wine Merchants, uh, and we really miss you all, um, our customers of both Tyndall's and Searson's, um, Tyndall's especially, and we're with you in this, and uh, I'm very glad we can all connect over a bit of wine today um, on this lovely rainy day. Um, so I hope you've all received your samples. I haven't had anything to the contrary. And those who don't have samples, thank you for tuning in. You will get a lot of benefit out of this as well. Um, if you could have two glasses in front of you so you can compare your samples uh, and a spittoon so you can pour them away afterwards, we'll be tasting in pairs. Um, so uh, do, do keep that up to you whether you want to spit or not. Obviously, you're not driving anywhere today. Um, bring on the days when we do get to taste together. But the advantages, I suppose, of tasting virtually are A, that you don't have to drive home, and B, importantly, that we can get Ricardo and Giorgio together, uh, the technical director of La Brachesca, Ricardo, and Giorgio, the winemaker at La Mortale, together for a tasting, which is something that wouldn't happen in real time because they're both very busy people. And obviously the icing on the cake is Filippo. Uh, and we have Chiara in the background doing all the hard, heavy lifting and the hard work. Um, so thank you. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, so we'll have lots of information today on the region, uh, the diversity, the myriad of styles. I just think it's fascinating. Um, and if you have any questions, please use the question and answer um, sort of app thing on it. Uh, to ask and I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, if there's something you really, really want to ask and I'm ignoring it, just, just ask again. Uh, it sh I should be able to get to you all though. Uh, we will be recording this if any of you um, need to watch again or have to be called away, um, that's no problem. So uh, we plan to run for about 90 minutes. Um, we'll, well, we'll see. We'll see how long Filippo's introduction lasts. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so I'm going to um, introduce the panel. We have Georgia Dimitriou of Le Mortale. We have Ricardo Cecchi 
of La Francesca and doing an overall introduction for Antinori is Filippo, who I think you all know quite well. Um, so I'm going to ask Georgia to introduce herself and speak a little bit about um, what she's, where she's been, what she's done. Over to you, Georgia. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's really nice being here and uh, knowing that you are numerous out there watching us. Uh, my name is Georgia Dimitriou, and as my last name reveals, I'm Greek. Uh, so a um, few words about me, uh, traveling a bit uh, back in the time. Uh, the only way to move around nowadays, by the way. <laughs> uh, back in 2009, I graduated from um, Agricultural University of Athens, uh, and I left Greece uh, uh, to continue my studies in France. Uh, and where I had my master's degree in uh, viticulture and winemaking uh, in Supagro de Montpellier and in Ita de Bordeaux. Uh, well, uh, my adventure uh, started at uh, Chateau Kirwan, a Grand Cru Classé at uh, Margot Appellation, uh, my first and uh, quite precious uh, experience. Uh, after that, I kept uh, traveling uh, around the world. I uh, worked uh, in uh, Napa Valley, California, in uh, Yarra Valley, Australia, and Marlborough, New Zealand. Uh, these steps uh, brought me back uh, in Bordeaux, uh, where I took on uh, uh, the position of winemaker in uh, Pomerol uh, for a couple of years. But I guess my heart was beating for Italy after all. So um, in 2015, where the opportunity came up uh, to become uh, the winemaker of Mortel and work for a wine legend, uh, the wine legend of Italy, Antinori, well, I couldn't miss it. So uh, here I am today with you. Thank you, Georgia. Brilliant. Uh, I'm gonna pass over to Riccardo, uh, Riccardo Cecchi of La Brachesca. Um, over to you, Ricardo. Yes, hello everyone. Um, well, I graduated in 2014. I graduated in 2014 uh, in uh, Florence at the University of Agriculture in, in Florence. And then I left Italy, of course. I went to France and I studied in the same places where Georgia did. So I was oh. between Supagro and Bordeaux for one year. Then the Euromaster also had the second year, so I moved to Geisenheim in Germany, uh, university uh, very close to the Mosul. And, um, and after that, I did another master, which was with the OIV, so the International Organization of Wine and Vines, which was uh, based in Paris. And this gave me the opportunity to travel a bit around the world. I visited almost... Uh, <clears throat> 35 countries in uh, less than one year and a half. And in the meanwhile, I got to work when there, was the, when there were the harvest seasons uh, in Napa Valley, but mainly in Italy. So, uh, of course, in Tuscany, also in Sicily. And uh, the last experience I had was uh, here close to the Bargino, where we are right now with the Antinori, was uh, a little um, winery in San Casciano. Uh, and then Antinori put a look on me and decided to, to take me here under its wing. And, um, and then I'm here as a brand manager of Laura Cesca, which is the state that uh, Antinori has in Tuscany, uh, in, close to Montevulciano, so southeastern part of Tuscany. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, and now I'm going to ask Filippo to give a relatively short introduction on the Antinori family and the estates um, for those of you who don't uh, don't know that much about them. So, Felipe. Okay. So, welcome to everybody. Um, we have one hour and a half, right? Thank you. So, I will speak for about one hour and 20 minutes. So, I'm going to have one minute to take the one. No, no, I'm kidding. You know, I'm the old guy in the room because I've been working for Antinori for about 30 years. Uh, by in the commercial part of the company, not neither an enologist or a viticulture, it's nothing at all. So, but I play through the experience that I have having worked for so long for, for Antinori. What I can say is that Antinori is a family owned company, the Antinori family. Uh, the, it all started back in uh, 1385, so now we are in the 27th generation. 
when uh, Giovanni Di Piero Antinori joined the Florentine Arte dei Binatieri, which in English translated by winemaker Steve. So since then, a member of the family has always played, uh, let's say, a role in the winemaking world, either as a wine merchant or a land owner, uh, buying or selling grapes and so on. But it is in the last, let's say, 60 years that Antinori has seen a huge acceleration in terms of, let's say, investment, uh, land purchasing, up to becoming nowadays Europe's largest premium vineyard owner. Because our mantra is, if you want to make a good wine, you have to own, let's say, the, 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 the vineyard. So we are a full uh, cycle producer from planting vines. I'm, I'm going to stop you for a minute, yes. Filippo. We thought the sound isn't great. Uh, we were just having a little online discussion on it. Do you have, ah. is, are there any headphones in the room that you can use or use Ricardo's computer? Yeah, there we go. You can see, you can ah, okay, see okay, in, okay. in Italy, they what, are what, what, miles apart. <laughs> There we go. Uh, okay. Can oh you my hear? God, that is so much better, uh, uh, Filippo. Yeah, it's, it's, not my, it's not my fault. It's the technology that you prayed me today. Oh, so, I mean, okay. you know, well, you did, you virtual tastings. We don't you need didn't to. Hear anything. You didn't hear anything of what I said. A little bit, but it was very muffled. So I think we're going to have to extend your talking time a little bit longer. You are lucky now I got half the time that I had before. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to repeat a bit what. So I'm, about me, I mean, 30 years in Antinori in the commercial, let's say, segment part of the company. So I'm not neither an enologist or a viticulturist, but let's say I draw on my experience in this, let's say, in the wine making, uh, in the wine world. Um, so about Antinori in brief, uh, the Antinori family has been in the wine business since 1385, a date which marks the let's say, joining of uh, Giovanni Di Piero Antinori to the Florentines Arte de Vinatieri, which was a minor art, which translates as winemaker's guild. So since then, a member of the family has always been involved in the wine, uh, let's say, industry, the wine business, either playing the role of wine merchants or, let's say, buying and selling grapes. But I was stressing that it is in the last, I would say, uh, 60 years, and mostly in the last 30 years that Antinori has, uh, let's say, given a strong impulse, acceleration to the purchasing of, of land, of vineyards, let's say, so as to become a full cycle producer, to become fully independent from our entry-level wines up to our top wines like Tignanello Solaia. So our, our mantra is a good wine can be made only if you, let's say, uh, can count on your grapes. So that's why nowadays Antinori at the moment is Europe's largest uh, premium vineyard owner. So we are a full cycle producer. We buy land, plant vines, pick grapes, ferment, macerate grapes, bottle the wine and sell the wine uh, through a network of importers, one of which is Tindal Wines, which is doing, by the way, a great job for us. And um, so Antinori is at the same time uh, a custodian of traditions, but at the same time is known to be a very modern and innovative uh, winery because throughout its long history, it is known for having made very uh, bold choices, like just to mention a few, abandoning the use of straw uh, cover flecks where the old Chianti were bottled because it was clearly good uh, a good thing, but not certainly was not a, conveying a good image for the Chianti appellation uh, in, uh, in general. Um, then the first to, uh, to uh, produce a vino nouveau, vino novello, for instance, in Italy, along, uh, along with Gaia. Perhaps a few know that Gaia was producing a long time ago a vino novello, vino nouveau. Um, the first to uh, um, Abandon the Chianti Classico appellation with the, the revolutionary wine that was Tignanello. Tignanello was made in the heart of Chianti Classico, but let's say we break away from the appellation because at that time the Chianti rules dictated that white grapes had to be blended with Sangiovese. 
So uh, linking to old tradition, uh, to the old formula of the Chianti making, uh, made by Bettino Ricasoli, which, let's say, uh, put, um, dictated, let's say, the blend of Malvasia and Trebbiano along with Sangiovese to render the wine drinkable, because the Sangiovese at that time was too harsh, with rough hedges, was literally undrinkable. So, uh, um, in a few words, Chianti, long time ago, at the time when Tignanello was invented and crafted, was a wine meant to quench thirst, not certainly to uh, uh, to um, spark emotions or let's say or or good quality that that and and that was one of the most important uh, moves that Antino decision that Antinori made and that was um, a moment in which Antinori and the Italian wines were started to be taken seriously by international audience tasters and so on and from Tignanello onwards Solaya and so on, many Tuscan producers, and not only, started making the so-called Super Tuscan. So Antinori has been always at the, a, a, a forerunner, has always been at the forefront of innovation. So it's a very old family, but at the same time, very modern in many ways. Now, the president of the company is Albiera Antinori, um, the two sisters, Allegra and Alessia, uh, both play different roles within the company in different, uh, uh, let's say, segments of the commercial segments of the company. But Piero Antinori, nowadays the honorary president, still is every day in his office. He is very adamant about quality, never compromising. Um, he is very democratic in his approach to the wine industry because. Antinori can craft wine that cost a few euros up until crews like Tignanello and Solaya. So we, in a way, adhere and respect the tradition that wants Antinori, uh, excuse me, wants wine to be a daily pleasure, not certainly a pleasure for a few. That's, and that's why we have a large gamut of wines and prices. Uh, Antinori, and then I finish has several investments in Tuscany in the very well-known areas like uh, Chianti Classico, Bulgari, and Nobile di Montepulciano or Brunello di Montalcino, but new emerging areas, today is like Le Mortelle in the lower Maremma, as well as in Piedmont and in Puglia and abroad as well. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna mention all of these investments, but this should give you the idea of how Antinori wants to put uh, itself in, in question, uh, not willing to rest on, his on, his, on its laurels, but advancing and, uh, let's say, risking a lot, investing everywhere. So, if anybody later has questions about Antinori in general, I'm going to be here and uh, I leave the, the word to others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet, and all the participants, certainly. Thank you, Filippo. That's Thank brilliant. Um, that was very impressive as well. Tight timing. Um, it was excellent. So I'm going to share the screen again just to, as a little guide to get us going. Um, and uh, a family business built on discovery and innovation. And I'm sure that um, throughout this uh, webinar, we might have questions about why Maremma? Why um, Montepulciano? Why did Pierre Antonori decide to go there? So we'll um, we'll broach those as we move on. Let me just uh, move the slide on. No, nope, hold on. Um, so what I find uh, fascinating is the fact that um, fascinating and scary is the numerous indigenous grape varieties and international grape varieties and different names for all these great varieties within Italy. There are thousands and thousands of varieties, thousands of different soils and thousands of different microclimates within the region. So, you know, I hope today we're going to touch on a little bit of that. We're not obviously going to um, expand on all of that, but uh, we'll give you an idea of why the wines in, around the areas of Italy taste so different. Um, so what I'm going to say now is if you can have the first two wines in your glasses, um, so that is the Vivia and the, um, the Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, the one and two, basically. Um, and we're going to move on. 
Um, and we're going to ask Georgia again to um, yes. talk about her estate, uh, production levels, climate, varieties planted, and the sustainable activities. And Georgia, don't be put off by the slide. I might just go through some pictures um, yes. as you're talking. Yeah, <laughs> so over to you. Okay. okay. Uh... Okay, so yeah, the, uh, the estate uh, is uh, located in uh, the heart of Lower Marema, uh, close to the town of Castellón de la Pescaya, in about uh, 10 kilometers uh, from the sea, um, in the province of Grosseto, so we are in south of Tuscany. Uh, especially for someone who has never been to Marema, um, I must say that it's a really um, timeless region with ancient roots and uh, a really unique place from a naturalistic point of view. Um, we have uh, actually the Italian elegance uh, in harmony uh, blended with uh, the wildness of uh, its landscapes. Uh, so um, to start with the name and uh, dispel any doubts, uh, La Mortella in the local dialect is uh, stands for a um, wild myrtle, so it's a fragrant shrub that uh, grows along the, uh, the coast uh, of Marema and uh, became uh, the symbol of, uh, of the estate. Uh, the property is uh, 200, uh, uh, consists of 270 hectares all around the, the winery, uh, 170 of which are planted in vineyards. Uh, our main varieties uh, are black varieties, international ones, so Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and a small parcel of Carmenere. Uh, the white ones uh, include uh, Vermentino and Manzonica, which are local varieties, Italian ones, and uh, a, a part of uh, Viognier. Uh, so, um, uh, Coastal Marema, just to give you an idea of the, of the climate, uh, we, uh, we are in in a warm uh, Mediterranean climate we have. So uh, with uh, dry, warm and dry uh, summers and mild winters, uh, rainfalls that are concentrated in the autumnal months, uh, fortunately after, after harvest. <laughs> so um, we have uh, a really, um, a lot of sunshine, a lot of it. And um, it's, a, it's an ideal place because we have uh, for, for grape growing because we have a, a little or uh, almost no risk of spring frost and optimum uh, conditions of flowering and fruit set. Uh, so yeah, uh, its position, it's uh, uh, quite ideal for uh, late ripening varieties such as uh, the international ones that I uh, mentioned uh, to you. Uh, they do have all the time they need here to, to really mature. Uh, and uh, we have uh, mild uh, uh, water stresses, uh, depending on the parcel, on its exposure to the sun, uh, and different type soils that uh, can go from more sandy and clay ones uh, to more stony ones uh, up in the, in the hills, uh, as you can see uh, in the photo, uh, on the hilly parts of the estate. Um, well, uh, yeah, our production levels are around uh, 250,000 bottles um, per year. And uh, as for sustainability, well, it's a great issue uh, for, uh, for Marema, for the whole uh, area. Uh, as, I, as I said before, it's a really unique place from a naturalistic point of view. So uh, you should know that a great part of the coast of Marema is considered to be a protected national park and the locals do live from ecotourism. Uh, so uh, the Mortelle undoubtedly is on the forefront of these uh, of this, um, of this, uh, developments. Um, the idea for the whole project of Mortelle, uh, for the whole project of Mortelle uh, started in 2009 uh, from uh, the desire of Antinori family to build a modern winery, uh, which uh, without compromising uh, the natural beauty of, uh, of the place, uh, of the area. And focusing on uh, natural uh, material, uh, building materials, on uh, sustainable uh, design, and um, on uh, minimizing uh, the impact uh, uh, towards the environment. So uh, the architectural um, uh, studio that uh, took on the, the project actually reconstructed the pre-existing hill and hiding there uh, the winery. Uh, 
um, the idea was uh, to to fully to take full advantage of both uh, gravity and uh, thermic isolation. Um, uh, well, uh, the cellar is actually uh, pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, as well. The fact that the, the whole project was completed in two years, just two years, which is quite uh, quite fast. Um, the cellar is designed in uh, three levels uh, to accompany the grapes from uh, from um, uh, the reception uh, through to all uh, uh, vinification uh, winemaking uh, procedures, so fermenting and uh, aging barrels, uh, barrel aging and bottling. So you can see here the, the um, extremely beautiful uh, barrel uh, room. Uh, I, I in, think it's... Uh, is it true that it's built down into the rock, Georgia, um, because that helps with the humidity for aging the barrels? Yes, it, it's actually uh, the thermic isolation, as I was uh, saying. So uh, the, the conditions are quite stable uh, uh, during uh, the whole year. And we also have infiltration of water uh, through these uh, stones that you can see. It's a particular uh, stone uh, called arenaria uh, that we can find in the uh, in, uh, in some uh, uh, in the soil of Martelle, so it's a, a kind of uh, stone, a sandy sto stone, and we do have infiltrations that help uh, the, uh, to maintain the humidity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, apart from gravity and uh, other uh, saving energy, um, saving energy technologies, really uh, innovating ones at uh, Le Martelle. Uh, the, as the, the carbon dioxide um, circulation is very clever as well, isn't it? Yeah, it was a big problem at that time. I mean, uh, to how to evacuate uh, all the CO2 produced during uh, fermentations from uh, a winery, which is uh, practically into the hill. Uh, so um, we thought uh, to take advantage of the gravity uh, as uh, CO2 is heavier than uh, oxygen. So at the, at the most profound uh, level, at the lower level of the winery, we constructed uh, a room where the CO2 goes there by gravity. And uh, with uh, tubes that follow the, tr the gravity as well, uh, we evacuated towards the plants, towards the, the vineyards, uh, where it, it can be done a sort of uh, recycling of the CO2. So the, the plants can use it for, um, for uh, photosynthesis synthesis and to release it as oxygen back to back to the nature yeah it's brilliant nature doing its work <laughs> yes and all these uh without using any energy i mean uh without uh, pumping uh, out uh, co2 just uh taking advantage of, of gravity and it's... yes <laughs> that's brilliant that's that's wonderful georgia i i'm going to ask ricardo about uh La Bercesca now, um, but I have to say, if when we can travel again, guys, uh, Le Mortale is quite ex amazing. Um, we did a team trip over there in better times, and it was so impressive. We all decided that a James Bond film should be filmed there. Uh, <laughs> you could see Daniel Craig sort of shooting over the side and uh, <laughs> sliding down the things, and yeah, yeah, so in the future. Yeah, um, we hope to see that happen. Uh, okay, so Ricardo, I'm going to ask you to talk about uh, La Bercesca. Um, and I will, I'll move through the slides a little bit uh, while, we, while you're talking. So, okay, over to you. So, um, La Bercesca was bought by the Antinoris family in uh, 1990. And uh, at that time, it was almost the same that you see right now in a very, worst condition. I mean, uh, then of course, as soon as Tinori arrives and uh, he creates this uh, location as a real and proper cellar and aging cellar. And, um, and this allow us to produce, to start producing one of the first DOCG of Italy, which is the Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. It was actually the the, the first also before the Brunello di, di Nobile, you see Brunello di Montalcino, because um, the first little thing that you have on the neck of the bottle, let me show you. So actually this little label that certifies that is a DOCG, the first one was for the for a, a Vino Nobile. Um, clearly at the time, the Vino Nobile, because of its history 
and it was, as you all know, uh, based with Sangiovese grapes. Um, it was a very important uh, then appellation that, of course, started growing a lot. And this strategic position, as you can see here in the map, uh, which is, it seems really far from the city, Monte Pulciano, but this is actually a strategic position because on the other side, so on the right side of La Bracesca, we have Cortona. So this allow us to be in, in a sort of a, in between of two different cities with two different soils and uh, peculiarities and allow us to produce both Vino Nobile di Montepulciano and Cortona DOC, which is one of the most recent appellation. And we will get back to, to it uh, later on. So as I was saying here, as you can see, we are pretty close to Montalcino, but is in Montalcino that stopped the Mediterranean influence. So that's why in Montepulciano, in our area, we talk about continental climate, which is very, very, very similar also to all the internal uh, areas where we grow vines. I'm thinking about uh, most of the French appellation, I'm thinking many others. And clearly the continental climate allow us to have uh, both very, very cold winter with lots of rain, but at the same time, we have a very hot and dry summer. So this big uh, thermic excursion that we have between the temperature, we have almost always 15 degrees different in between the maximum temperature and the lowest temperature. This allow us, this allow the, our vines to uh, keep this acidity, which is something that is very important in our area. In our area. Because of course, especially when we have very hot and dry summer, the acidity is something that usually is, is not one of the focal point. But the fact that we have very cold winter and the temperature uh, change uh, this way, this allows us to have these beautiful acidities that not only gives uh, pleasure when you drink the wine because it doesn't uh, get too tough or too heavy, um, but at the same time, it allows us to have very, very, very aging uh, with, with the wines with an, a very important aging potential. Um, so as you can see, there's another uh, particularity, which is the Lago Trasimeno, which uh, actually uh, give this sort of uh, what we call subcontinental climate, because clearly the Lago Trasimeno, the Lake Trasimeno, uh, influences a bit the temperature, the cold temperature in winter and the very hot and dry temperature in, in summer. So it's sort of mitigated. And this allows us again to have this sort of very balanced uh, product. Then talking about the soils, um, as you were showing, uh, we are exactly on top of the Valiano Hill, let's say, which uh, if you, if you take a look from a distance, it doesn't really seem a hill because as you saw, it's pretty flat area. We are in the Chiana Valley, which got this name from a, a typical uh, animal. I mean, the Chianina, which is a, a, a particular uh, kind of meat that we produce in the area. And Valiano, however, it's, it's about 300 meters above the sea level. Uh, as you can see here, we have mainly sandy soils. And that's why in this area and going towards the right, we have mainly the Cortona DOC appellation. While getting back to the Montepulciano, so on the left side, we start having some clay. And that is exactly where we produce uh, our nobile. In fact, uh, we have, uh, of course, as you saw from the first picture, a lot of vineyards around the state, but we have also some plot on the hill of Montepulciano, which are, uh, located exactly on the clay soils. Because as you know, there are varieties that grow much better on clay soils and other varieties that grow very well in sandy soils. So that's why this strategic position allows us to produce both in an excellent way. And um, well, I mean, I don't want to run out of time. If you have a particular question, then no, that's brilliant, Riccardo. I, I found it fascinating when we visited that the fact that you're literally you're standing on the estate. And if I go back, you're looking one side is in Cortona and the other is in. Um, uh, here we go in uh, in Montepulciano. So in this picture you can see Cortona because if you go in the background, you see that li that little town on top of the hill that is Cortona. 
Yeah. While where we are sitting right now, there is Montepulciano. Yeah, exactly. That is Cortona, and where we are sitting right now is Montepulciano. So yeah. imagine this situation. We are exactly in the middle. And so, you know, you think that uh, it's one estate, it's very straightforward, but uh, we introduce the complexities of two, two regions under one, under one estate. Um, but it also, it's so interesting and fascinating. And when we taste, everyone will see just how um, diverse the offering from La Brochesca is. Um, so we've spoken a lot. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, but let's do our first tasting. So we have our first glimpse of the 2020 vintage of Viv Via, and then we also have La Brachesca 2017, the Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Um, so I'm gonna ask Georgia to introduce her wine, um, and I'm very much looking forward to tasting. Um, over to you, Georgia. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Harriet. Uh, so Vivia uh, that you're having in the bottle, uh, by the way, it's, uh, we bottled it like a couple of weeks ago. So uh, you are, you are uh, maybe the first one uh, to, uh, to taste it. <laughs> uh, so Vivia is, uh, is a really uh, delicate, fragrant uh, white wine. Uh, it's a refreshing blend between local and international varieties. Uh, we have, um, it, it was thought uh, to be um, something different from the monovarietal uh, white wines that we find a lot in the region, so uh, uh, Vermentinos and Sonica. Uh, and of course, uh, the idea was as well to distinguish it from uh, our Vermentino di Guadaltasso. Uh, so um, its name is... Um, we say it's coming from a, a word pan, like uh, the three varieties that compose it, uh, Vermentino, Vionien, and Ansonica, but it's actually Marchese's uh, granddaughter uh, name, uh, Vivia. Uh, so yeah, it's 60% uh, Vermentino, uh, uh, excuse me, 50% Vermentino, 40% Vionien, and 10% of Ansonica. Um, it, it's a wine that, uh, I, I don't know how it's called in English. I mean, in Italian, it's uh, it's uh, solare. I mean, you, you can feel the sun when you when you taste it. It's a wine. Uh, you have the tra uh, translation, <laughs> Harriet. Uh, no, of, of, but I'm just. I was just going to say that today we're not feeling the sun in Ireland, but it is certainly bouncing out of the glass. The aromatics are fantastic on this wine. Yes, and I get I, what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> If, if I turn uh, the camera, you will, you will see it. <laughs> so here today is a really sunny day. It's a really beautiful day. <laughs> uh, well, it's coming to us. It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> through the glass, exactly. So um, in the glass, you have uh, the peachy character of uh, Viognier. Uh, you have uh, pear aromas and uh, green apple aromas of Vermentino. Well, you, you even have um, uh, uh, hints of herbs uh, that, uh, that's coming, uh, reminding a bit of Sonica. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a really fragrant and enjoyable wine. So in the mouth, it's uh, kind of um, fresh, uh, a bit of salty, salty. And um, you find the same citrus uh, aromas that you have in the, in the nose as well. Um, yep. I think it's lovely and textural, Georgia, um, because the, obviously there's no, there's no oak involved here. It's very much no. about the fruit. Yeah, um, exactly. And the acidity is, is holding its own and just displaying those flavors beautifully, isn't it? Um, I love the freshness of tasting a new vintage when it's just as it should be and just aromatic and 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 delicious. Um, I hope that everyone at home is enjoying it as well. It certainly wakes the palate up in the morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. You're um, and I now know I'll never forget the varieties in it because of the the Vivia. <laughs> um, obviously, I knew them all the time, Filippo. Uh, <laughs> Um, this actually isn't available in Ireland at the moment, but if we get good feedback, I'm sure we can change that very <laughs> rapidly. Um, okay, Ricardo, over to you with our first red of the day. Thanks, Georgia. You're welcome. 
So here we have the Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. This is actually the flagship of our state because clearly it represents the history of this wine and uh, also the estate. Um, as you can see here in the label, you see this armed arm, right? Oops, there we go. And this is, it has been kept from the noble family, noble family um, from who was bought the winery in 1990. They, they were called Conti Bracci. So Conti means it's like a sort of no, noble family. And Bracci in Italian means arms. So that's why you have this arm, which is armed with this word. So such a traditional image, which is exactly representing the tradition of the uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Um, the blend in this wine is, I would say, mainly Sangiovese. Then in some vintages, you have some hint of Merlot, but it's just a tiny bit that it varies, of course, every year, depending on the vintage. And um, we harvest the grape, we macerate it, not too much, because we don't want to extract too many polyphenols, because otherwise the wine would become very tough. This has to be a very easy and enjoyable wine. We have, we are trying actually to remove from the minds of the people the idea of that Vino Nobile is something really tough and heavy and you have to drink it only with the big stacks or whatever meat and meat and meat. No, it's not this way anymore. Uh, we always like to have this sort of acidity um, and also the fruitiness of the Sangiovese that I'm sure you, you feel by, smelling it. I, um, the, oh, just yeah. to, Ricardo, just to touch on the fact that on our notes, obviously, um, we've used the traditional name for the region of the Sangiovese, the Prunolo Gentile. Uh, yeah. Just because you all, you Italians, you love to confuse us sort of common folk. <laughs> uh, and uh, you love to put in all these extravagant names in different regions. So we think we're tasting a completely different variety when actually it's Sangiovese. So, yeah. um, Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, well, so I mean, it's very simple uh, thing because uh, in Tasca, you know, Sangiovese is one of the main grape, uh, grape variety. And, uh, you know, it, had always, it has always been this sort of fight between Chianti Classico Sangiovese, Chianti Sangiovese, Brunello di Montalcino Sangiovese, Vino Nobile di Montalcino Sangiovese. So I think that Sangiovese has, I think, more than 100 clones, which means uh, little difference in terms of genetic uh, stuff um, that varies from clone of Sangiovese to clone of Sangiovese. At that time, because, uh, you know, when they were producing Sangiovese in, in uh, Montepulciano, the idea of the Prugnolo Gentile came out from, uh, it was just a way of um, calling the Sangiovese because Prugnolo, it reminds the prugna, which is the um, plump, you know, so this sort of a dark fruit and sweet fruit in a sense. And gentile in Italian means kind. Why? Because usually the tannins of these wines of the Sangiovese that grows in the Montepulciano area is very different from some of the uh, friend uh, of, from Montalcino. Uh, so it's a little bit more kind, meaning that it's a little bit softer, you know, silkier. So that's why Prugnolo Gentile. Some people also say that Prugnolo, again, to remind the Prugna, so the, the plum, that has this sort of shape, oval shape, because at that time, maybe because they had some diseases in their vineyard, they saw the grapes that were a little bit with this sort of shape. So they call it Prugnolo Gentile also for this reason. So, however, there is no scientific documents who says that the Sangiovese from Montepulciano is a Prugnolo Gentile. This is just a way to call it that way, okay? Well, I think uh, it's a lovely name. It has a real romance about it. It's, yeah. uh, it's it has a lot of stories, yes, all the stuff in Italy. Yeah, um, should, should, we, should, we, should we taste? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> So, I mean, you are the master of wine, so I, I won't say any word. No, you're, you, you're, you're, you are the font of all knowledge on this, Ricardo. Uh, the joys of being a master of wine and the wine universe being so big is the fact that you can never know everything and you're always learning. And that's why I love tastings like this. 
because you well, know, I mean, what I feel at the nose, as I said, you have these red fruits, you know, these are very coming to your nose, um, which is the, the typical, I would say, smell of the Sangiovese when there is sun. Uh, when you put it in the mouth and you taste it, um, as you can see, you don't have this impression of toughness and, you know, over tannins and no, it's very soft. It has this sort of acidity that I was telling you before, which uh, creates this uh, character of the wine, which is not super light, but it's not at the same time super heavy. So you drink it really with everything. I mean, it happens here in Italy, you know, when you have also, I would say appetizer and you have some prosciutto called meats, whatever, you can drink it and it's enjoyable. I love the texture of the, the Prunolo uh, Gentile tannins. They're just very, almost like velvet across the palate. Yeah. Really lovely. Uh, lovely, that dark fruit, a little bit of licorice, sort of mocha. It just, it's really expressive. Leather tones, you know, I love the evocative kind of smells and tastes of wines from, uh, from here. They just, they give us so much more. And I think, you know, a lot of people will go for Sangiovese and Chianti because we all understand it, it's easy to say. But uh, this, this expression you're getting from Montepulciano is, uh, is, is lovely. Yeah, and as you say, as it's called, it's the, it's the noble wine of Montepulciano. Yeah, it is, it, it is. It, Look, yeah, it, it, and also follow the tradition because we are vinifying it. I mean, we are not vinifying, but we are aging it in the big botte. The botte, you know, is the big wood cask typical from Tuscany, which goes usually from 25 hectoliters up to 45 and so on. And it stays there for one year because the bote doesn't release any, I would say, wood aromas, but it's just the perfect aging recipient for the Sangiovese, especially if you want to obtain a Sangiovese that, of course, has to have character, but at the same time, it doesn't have to over, uh, you know, doesn't have to bother you in the mouth. I don't know how to say it. it doesn't have to be too heavy to I think I think this is the joy of Sangiovese and winemaking in Italy is is the use of these larger oak casks, the botti, is it that that uh, that just allow oxygen in but don't overwhelm the fruit. And so you can get the expression from the vineyard, which is what we all are pursuing now, you know. And I and I think perhaps a lot of people um, in the past have had the misconception that um, perhaps bigger companies, even though Antonori is a family business, perhaps they use a lot of new French oak to sort of polish the wines. But that's very much not the way of winemaking within the estates of Antonori, is it? It's 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 a pursuit of the vineyard expression rather than the Cooper's uh, expression. Um, I think it's really really important. Uh, um, I've got a, questions about the retail prices. I'll, I'll find out um, for you guys and I'll answer those on the chat. Um, okay, so that was, those were delicious start to our tasting today. Um, we're gonna move on to the expression of the more international varieties. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk about the, uh, the influx of international varieties in Italy in general. Um, and Syrah obviously has become a famous DOCG of uh, Cortona. And then as Georgia was saying, she is very much the champion of the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc uh, and Merlot um, from Marema. So I always worry when one of my panel walks off just before I'm back to ask him to say something, <laughs> but he's back <laughs> with his acello. Uh, so um, over to you, Ricardo, to talk about your acello from Cortona, which is uh, Syrah. And I don't know how many of you guys listening uh, knew that Syrah is um, one, of, one of the sort of famous grapes of Cortona. Um, and it'll be really interesting to taste this morning. So over to you, Ricardo. Yes, so I'm here with the Akello. So Akello is totally different world. Even if we have maybe three, four, five kilometers, uh, it, it's totally changed. I mean, it's totally another world. Uh, so the Cortona DOC is such a, a recent appellation because it was founded in the 20s, in the, 20, in the 2000, okay? So it only has 20 years, which is nothing compared to the other appellation in Tuscany. But I mean, they, there were these few growers, of which we were part of, of course, that we found out that there were many similarities 
with one of the, I would say, the homeland of Syrah, which is the Côte d'Iron in France. And uh, we got actually inspired from that. And uh, because we had the climate, which is very similar, we had the soil, which is very similar. I'm talking, I'm talking about, for example, those sandy soils that you can also find in the Côte d'Iron septentrional. So the northern part, especially in Côte d'Iron, this little, you know, beautiful uh, places, and they produce Sira. So we were lucky to have this uh, wonderful estate where we grow uh, Sira that was very similar to the, uh, let's say, area in France. Uh, and it was a bit different from the Australian ones and uh, Californian ones and South American ones uh, because of this, again, of the acidity, of the temperature of the difference of temperature between day and night. So this allows us to produce, uh, finally, good qualitative Syrah. And Akelo is the, um, the first level of Syrah. So it's um, Akelo, it comes from the name of the god, which you can see in the background uh, behind the name. Now, this is the new label, which will be from the 2019. Many of you at home maybe saw the old label. There was this little god here. And he was the, the god of the abundance, so being being healthy and be you know have so that's why we we pair it to the wine because you have wine when you are fine when you are happy and you want to enjoy. And uh, well, it's mainly Syrah. Uh, also here, depending on the vintage, we may add some uh, little bit, tiny bit of Merlot, and thirty percent of the total blend. Uh, spent uh, almost six months in stainless steel tanks in order to keep the freshness and the aromacity of the wine and of the Syrah. While the 70% uh, um, has a passage in uh, barrels of second and third passage, and I'll tell you why barrels, um, in order to, to have this, to get a little bit more structure. As you know, Syrah is such a, a very, uh, is such a, is a variety, um, very rich in polyphenols that you know includes uh, tannins, anthocyanins, flavols, flavonols, and so on. So to make it easy, when you have a lot of these chemical compounds, you need air in order to let them, how to say, um, equilibrate and balance themselves. So that's why we decided to use the barrel because clearly the barrel being a small recipient has more surface of the wine in contact with the recipient itself. So you have a better exchange in oxygen. Um, and this allows us to, to have a much more balanced wine. Also, this wine is meant to be a wine for aperitifs, but you can also have a dinner with it. Clearly, it's, total, it's totally different from the Nobile because there are two different varieties. One is autochthon, one is international. Uh, the taste is different. The color of the wine, I'm sure you saw, uh, that is much more purpley rather than the, I would say, red and brown of the nobile. Mm -hmm. Also, the smell is much more, I would say, aromatic, more pepper, more, which is the typicity of the variety itself. So it's, it's lovely because it has the expression of a Northern Rhone Syrah, but with a little bit more, more weight of ripe fruit, um, which, which just gives you that expression of Cortona. Um, yeah. It is lovely. And you say the black pepper. I love that black pepper, smoky bacon hint. It's really there. Um, I'm dying to try it. That's right. So, I mean, of course, being a Syrah, the more you keep it open, the more it express. It's, it's incredible, the Syrah, because if you, if you leave this wine or the, the Brahma Sole that we see in a few moments in the glass and then you taste it later on, you will have totally different aromas and it's really breathed the wine. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's delicious. It's lovely, lovely plum tones to it, and um, that sort of dark coffee sort of hint on the finish. And and as you say, because Syrah is quite reductive, using those older oak barrels, you have this breadth of flavour, and you're not sort of tying it into itself, which you can see with quite a lot of Syrahs nowadays. That they 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 have reductive qualities that you really don't want to be there. But this is full of expression. Yeah, it's lovely, Ricardo. Really, really good. Thank you. Yeah, I hope everyone's going to have a chance to go back to these later and put them back in their little sample pots. Um, okay, Georgia, let us have a look at Botrosecco, um, please. Yes, uh, 
So, uh, Botroseco uh, is a blend uh, of uh, our two principal varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon for 60% and 40% uh, of Cabernet Franc. Um, so, yeah, as I, I was telling before, uh, Mortele is based on these international varieties. Uh, so our climate, uh, our uh, really long ripening seasons, uh, dry and warm, our um, uh, let these uh, uh, these varieties uh, to fully mature and have expressions that uh, that can be elegant, even if uh, we have a lot of sun and uh, um, high temperatures. Um, the thing is that uh, proximity to the sea, uh, along with um, the dominant wind uh, here in the region, uh, is called uh, called maestrale, uh, really mitigate our temperatures and uh, offer. Um, uh, offer uh, have, they have a cooling effect during summer and a warming effect uh, during uh, during winter. Uh, so we can have uh, cabernets that they are full bodied. Uh, with uh, tannins that they are fully mature, but uh, at the same time uh, we have um, we have not jammy aromas. We have uh, black fruit, uh, red fruit. Uh, we have um, yeah, and uh, some uh, herbaceous character of these uh, of these varieties. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, so so as I was saying, Botroseco. Uh, you, you want to say something? No, 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 don't worry. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, Botroseco is a blend of these two varieties. Uh, I'd like to say simple wine, but uh, please don't let me be misunderstood. I mean, simple is good. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoy Botroseco and uh, uh, I mean, I, I actually enjoy it uh, much uh, more often than our other wines. But uh, I mean, it's simple, but at the same time with a, with a, a character, uh, with it's a really sapid wine. Uh, we have a lot of aromas of red fruit and uh, hints of mint and tobacco. Um, it's a wine, uh, by the way, that uh, has uh, almost one year uh, aging uh, in barrels, uh, but uh, second and th third hand barrels. So the idea was, uh, as you were saying before, not, not to cover the var varietal uh, character and the expression of, uh, of our vineyards. Uh, Botroseco is coming from uh, the vineyards that have more sandy uh, and less clay soils. Um, so they're uh, soils that are uh, more warm and um, and can uh, can have uh, uh, expressions of cabernets that they are more uh, easy. Uh, I mean, without going to to overripe, uh, they have more freshness and easy does, to drink. Does the sandy soil um, make it difficult uh, when in particularly dry years? How do you deal with that? Do you have to irrigate, or do you have older vines that are um, more stable in in? Because obviously the water holding capabilities of sand is difficult, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So in the region, we do have the right to irrigate, uh, like emergency irrigation. We don't want, uh, we try to, to, to avoid using it, of course. Uh, what, where we are focusing our, uh, is uh, in techniques in the vineyards that allow us to maintain uh, the water availability and uh, sometimes even increase it in uh, uh, years that they are really dry, uh, such as um, techniques such as uh, um, uh, soil labor and uh, mulching and uh, I mean we are using a range of plants in the vineyards uh, that can uh, that can keep uh, the moisture of of the soil uh, we can um, and and don't pump water from the from the vineyards uh, during uh, the years uh, uh, we see that even uh, if we lower densities uh, of planting it's a good thing because we reduce water uh, competition uh, between the, the vines and at the same time um, we, uh, we, can, uh, have, um, uh, we can have more balance uh, uh, in terms of sugar and concentration and not to have excessive sugars and concentration, uh, having more yield per plant. Uh, um, 
and uh, yeah, we are focusing on techniques in the vineyard so that we can uh, that we can uh, uh, manage this. Yeah, it's really good. Um, okay, uh, so so let's let's taste it. Um. Yep. So. Um, as I was telling you in the mouth, we, we really have really soft tannins um, that, that makes it uh, easier to, to enjoy earlier. And uh, we have uh, uh, hints of dried fruits and uh, white pepper in the mouth as well. It's, it's a really a good and expressive wine and really good uh, value for money wine. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's lovely. I love the texture again. As you say, it's supple, really easy drinking. It's kind of like, what day are we on today? It's a Wednesday wine. Uh, just, you know, you sit down at the end of the day and it's just, it's got lots of complexity, lots of flavors. That lovely lifted sort of red currant flavor. Um, I love the expression of Cabernet Sauvignon and it's interesting what you say about the texture. Sorry, I share an office. Uh, it's interesting what you say about the texture uh in that um that it's uh it is softer it is gentler from the sandy soils which is a real sort of winemaking um assistant i suppose when you're trying to make a style like this that's more subtle more open um yeah it's it's really lovely i think uh uh people who talk about international varieties and their expressions around the world this is why we can do blind tasting and work out where they come from because there's a real difference there's a real sense of place in this wine despite it being uh, a sort of classic Bordeaux variety. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Well done. Uh, okay, so let's move on because uh, we have a few wines to get through. Um, we have, okay, hold on. There we go. So we're going to have two, um, two Syrahs. We're going to have a look at uh, the ageability of Syrah in um, Cortona and uh, and also the reason I've written laws and regulations is something that Ricardo has actually touched on already, which was the fact that um, they bought in the DOCG for Cortona, especially for Syrah, um, which is what they've done in many regions in Italy so that they're not, so that they're under law. I'll let Ricardo talk about it rather than getting my tongue twisted about it. Um, but we have the two vintages of uh, the Gramasole now, um, and those are in five and six in your samples, if, in case you're getting a bit confused as I was just then. So um, the two vintages we have are the 16 and the 13, um, which we're really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to comparing them anyway. And both of them are in stock in Ireland. So if you have a favorite, um, you know where to come. Okay, over to you, Ricardo. Yeah, so thank you again. Um, so Brahma Sole, first of all, the name, the name Brahma Sole means like Brahmare, it's, it's the verb that meaning that means craving, craving, so desiring, brahma, brahmare, and sole is sun, so that's that's something that actually it reflects the wine itself because, as you can, if you start tasting it, uh, both the sixteen and the thirteen, you have immediately this idea of uh, something very um, uh, ripened, you know, because uh, these plot because it's coming from a single vineyard uh this plot is um it's very well exposed you have a lot of sun heating during the the, the summer and uh, the fact that you have sandy soil um clearly put in a little bit of stress the plant but as i always like to say wines are a little bit like human so when you have this sort of little stress you're pushed to do more right when you have too much stress, you're, you, you, you give up. And when you don't have any stress, then you, you take it easy. So you think about other stuff. So having this sort of little stress really pushed the wine, the Brahma soul in this case, to express his power. Because as you can, as you can taste the, in the 2013, that now has almost six, seven years, you still have this power, but at the same time, you, have, you still have this acidity. So it's a wine that it seems still young, right? But at the same time, you can drink it right now because it's pleasurable. It, it gives you this sort of sensation of sweetness, which is not in terms of residual sugar, because all our wines have zero point something, drums, sugar, residual. So 
nothing. It's dry for the law and regulation. But you have this impression, this sweetness that is only the, the fruits that are, are ripened. And um, again, you have the pepper, again, you have all these sort of aromatic uh, flavors. I'm talking about also some licorice. And um, I mean, this is, this is a little bit the typicity of the Syrah. Of course, if you wouldn't be able to produce a Syrah which tastes of these uh, aromatic things, then it will mean that you do something wrong because what we do is to reflect what we have in the soil and we put it into a glass. So we don't like to intervene. Clearly, we help the wine to perform at its best. That's why we are using in this case, only in this case, the new barrels, uh, French oak, uh, because it really needs, because this wine is so powerful that it needs to have a longer aging uh, respect to the to the halo, so it's about 15 to 18 months of barriques, and then two years in bottle before being out in, to be sold, actually. So I, I think what's really interesting tasting the two together is the fact that both of them still taste so young, but also you have a real vintage variation going on here. So you have a sort of floral, high-toned fragrance in the 16. Um, which is very uh, specific in its in its aromatics, and then on the thirteen, the, there's a denser texture to it, and a, a, it's just more fruit and more savory. It's a stronger kind of wine, um, and I know that sixteen was an outstanding vintage for you guys, um, and you can really see the 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 expression is just ah, oh, it's da dancing on the palate and on the aromatics, and then but the thirteen is lovely because it's a real like sort of almost it's not a it's it's a real powerhouse of like just expression and muscle i like i just I, I love the difference in the fact that you can have these vintage variations and who knew today that we would be coming and tasting two syrahs from uh, cortona just up the road from montepulciano and see such difference like we would in the northern rhone i think it's it's really exceptional it's really interesting yeah that's exactly the beauty i mean what i like the wine to be is like to be respectful for the vintage because it means that you are doing the best with what you have you're not adding something or cutting something is you are you are you are there to make it perform at, at its best that's it you don't have to do nothing else so that's exactly what you can tell by tasting two different vintage of the same wine which aged the same way uh, the same recipient, the same everything, the same period of maceration. So it's really a matter of climates. It's a matter of soils. It's a matter of what the Syrah feels to produce in that particular vintage. Um, mm. I forgot to say at the beginning that uh, when we bought the estates in 1990, then we start to replant all our vines or our vineyards. Because they were very old. Uh, you know, the density for plantation was not that nice. So we were planted all step by step. So nowadays we have the perfect age for the, for the vines, which are all between 18 years and 25 years. Uh, so it's really, I think their, you know, their maximum expression, you know, yeah. they're not too old, they're not too young. They have their own roots, which are really uh, well formed. And so it's like, it's the perfect moment actually. So. Yeah, they're coming into their own, um, and as you say, you have another twenty years of them being in their in their prime, uh, twenty thirty years more longer. Um, yeah. So it's really really exciting. Um, yeah, those were really lovely. And what percentage of new oak was it? Was it uh, sort of sixty seventy percent or? Yeah, it's about sixty seventy percent. Then it depends on on the vintage mainly when you have. When you, when you tend to extract more, because you have a very nice, I'm, I'm talking about the 16, for, for instance. The 16 was the perfect vintage. You have cold winter, a lot of rain, so the soil get, you know, had all this water to keep, uh, to, to deal then with the summer, that was super dry. But at the end, you got the berries that were perfectly balanced. And that was perfect, so you could extract as much as you can, because, they were perfect, they were healthy, they were perfect relationship uh, between, you know, pulp and skin, and you have perfect technological ripeness, you have perfect technological ripeness, it was like really the top vintage ever. 
and as well as the 13, as well as the 11, for example, those were all great vintages. So it's funny. It was funny also for me to taste today those two vintages. It was really interesting because you can really tell. Clearly, the 13 was a little bit hotter. That's maybe why you were feeling a little bit more nerve, more you know, vibrancy. But uh, I mean, this is the balance is what we are always looking for. And uh, I think we did, uh, especially in the 16, because, you know, climate condition was perfect. Uh, the vintage was unbelievable. And uh, we try to do our best to, to produce such a, such a nice wine. However, yes, we mainly use new oak because uh, they need a little bit of, you know, also the release of some specific tannins of the barrels that kind of protect a, a too easy and fast uh, um, aging of the wine itself. So when you have some new new oak, that this gives you this sort of protection. Um, so yeah, mainly it depends. It sometimes it's the seventy percent new oak, sometimes it's hundred percent new oak. It really depends on the vintage. Yeah, it's uh, well. I think they're delicious, and I haven't tried them for a while. And I have to say that I'm really sad. I've only got a little pot. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually going to line them up beside their number to drink later uh, because they're too good to go in the spittoon. Um, so, so thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on with our slides, um, which aren't really. There we go. So, um, and now we've got the final two wines of our tasting, which is um, really sad because I think it's just been fascinating. You guys are amazing, and. Um, I've learned loads and I hope everyone else is enjoying it as much as I am and the wines are singing in the glasses. I think it must be a fruit day or a flower day today, but they're showing really well. Um, so we're going to start off, uh, we're going to we're going to start with Ricardo. There's no rest for the wicked here. I'm going to ask you to taste your Brachesca first. Um, uh, oh, look, yeah, no, no rest. Yeah. Oh yeah, well, I'm ready. Go. So yeah. now it's from 100% Syrah to 100% Sangiovese. So it's yeah. again a big change your hat. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I really suggest you to I don't know reach your glass, find a way. I don't know uh, because clearly we are talking about two different varieties, two different way of aging and producing, really making wine. Uh, here we are back on the Montepulciano side. When the when uh, Harriet uh, before gently show us the. Uh, the you know the picture where we had those two little hills you know as I say we are on Valiano and on the other side we have closer to Montepulciano we have clay soils oh that that one yeah before yeah however and um, you know the next one next one next one again Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. So here we are exactly on where you can see the, you know, the upper part where is Montepulciano, 600 meter. So the top one, the one that is really brown, I would say, and then the one that is a little bit gray bluish. Okay. So those are the two areas where we have those sort of uh, vineyards, especially Santa Pia, which is again, the name of the, of the plot of vineyard itself is located in the gray blue clay area. So you have the clay, which really gives exactly give this uh, uh, sort of nerve and uh, you know structure to the wine, because again, it's Sangiovese. And it's a vino nobile di Montepulciano Riserva, meaning that it ages for one more year. In this case, because it's the Sangiovese, it's one of the top Sangiovese that we produce, we tend to use Tonneau, which is sort of a medium way between the barrels and the boat. You know, barrels stops at 225 for Burgundy people, 20, 28, 228. But uh, well, then you have the boat that goes over uh, up to, you know, 25 hectoliters and so on. But when you have the tonneau, we are talking in this case about 300 liters recipient. So a little bit bigger. Um, from the normal barrels that you see. And uh, why this? Because clearly when you extract more, again, you need more protection, you need more contact with oxygen, and you need to sustain the wine until it's ready to be bottled. And then it also ages in bottle for almost two years. 
So it spends maybe one year, 12 to 15 months in Tonneau, and then it's only bought. Uh, because if you keep too much, the wine is the barrels, then you have the wood flavors coming in and you don't want to make wines that all taste like wood. You want to express the variety. So you only use the wood for that purpose. Um, so Santa Pia, I'll taste it with you. Just a second, I put it in my glass. There we go. So first of all, the color. Here we are talking about the, two, the, um, the 15 vintage, okay? I mean, 2015 vintage. Um, of course, the color is, is, is very different from the Syrah. Clearly, we are not talking about any purple thing, not at all. Here we are on brownish, reddish, brownish. Um, now this is a wine that has five, six years, but you can tell immediately from the taste, you have this sort of, um, I'll say, fresh characters. Those are all primary aromas mainly, so coming from the, you know, from the vineyard itself, just a few secondary, so coming from the, what is fermentation and aging process. And you start having also a little bit of the tertiary because you start feeling a little bit this sort of age flavor. But I, um, I love the texture of it. It's really gripping. You know, it's, it's, it's a, you, can, you can imagine having this with a serious steak or something, you know, it's, it's that kind of wine that would just work wonderfully with a, 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 a meal full of protein like that. But, but I just, um, I love the mineral depth that this has. It's surprising, you know, there's a minerality in there that, that uh, uh, I didn't expect. It's, um, it carries the acid along, um, along its sort of core, if you like. It's delicious, yeah, really showing well. And again, 15 was a ripe year, wasn't it? So, you know, it wasn't massively ripe, but it, it retains an elegance that's um, lovely, but it's still, again, so young. I mean, how long will this last for, Ricardo? <laughs> I mean, I, I like to drink wines not more than 20, 30 years, but um, I'm sure it can last really as much as you want. I mean, you uh, clearly is not, I don't know, it's not a Bordeaux wine, but uh, again, Sangiovese, if you think about also lots of the Pinot Nobile and also lots of the Brunello di Montalcino, they can age really 20, 25, 30, 35 years no doubt on that. Clearly, when you have these sort of hot vintages, you you may risk to have a a, a recent uh, I don't know, not crash of the wine. I, I wouldn't say that, but uh, you know, when you have a hot vintage, the 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 vines suffer a little bit more. So the wine it kind of have it it arrives tired, you know, in the bottle. Is of course. We are talking about after 20 years, 25, 30 years. So um, when you have those sort of hot vintages, I would prefer to drink it after maximum 20, 25 years. Yeah. But when you have vintages like 2016, I, I wouldn't have any problem to, to let it live again for other years because... Uh, the, the problem is keeping such a good wine hidden for so long. You'd have to like lock it in a cupboard and forget it was there. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. the problem in this house, especially in lockdown, Ricardo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all the crown jewels are being robbed, you know, by myself uh, in my own house anyway. Um, OK, so thank you for that. But I just think it's utterly delicious. And um, I know a lot of us aren't particularly familiar with La Brochesca and the wines um, because it's not a trendy region if you like and it's a little bit more difficult to understand but that's why we did this tasting so that everyone could um could enjoy the wines and and hear the story behind them and i just i really think you're going to have a whole new fan base after this um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh georgia over to you for your poggio alla nana which is one of my favorite wines i just think it's outstanding so okay I'm really looking forward to this <laughs> okay Thank you very much uh, for the compliment. Uh, so uh, yeah, Poggio alle nanne, uh, it's, um, it's as you say in the, in the, in the slide that uh, it's the pursuit of uh, quality and longevity and I would add uh, precision as well. Uh, it's a wine uh, that uh, was born to be the flagship uh, wine of uh, Le Mortele. Uh, its name uh, in Italian means uh, hill 
of uh, uh, the wild ducks that um, they are here uh, at Montretella. We do have a, a, a big um, lake, so they used to, uh, to live there. They, you, you can actually see them um, even nowadays. So the, the vineyards of Pojalenane that are from the hilly um, parts that uh, you can see part of them in the, in the photo behind the bottles. And, and the lake is our lake, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they're coming from these, uh, from these uh, uh, vineyards. Um, uh, Pojarenane was, uh, was meant uh, uh, not to be another uh, Bordeaux blend wine. Um, we wanted to, to differentiate ourselves, um, I mean, uh, itself from, uh, uh, I repeat myself and I say uh, Guadaltaso, but uh, just because it's our uh, closest reference and uh, uh, biggest competitor inside Antinori's family. So uh, yeah, it was um, a way to differentiate as well inside Marema because we, we do have a lot of uh, um, Merlot-based uh, uh, wines, uh, Cabernet uh, Sauvignon-based wines, Sangiovese-based wines blended with Cabernets, uh, but uh, uh, Cabernet Franc based wines, uh, there are, um, they are rare. So um, through the years, we, we were getting more convinced that that was the right choice because of the really gracious expression of Cabernet Franc here at Mortele. Um, till 2015, where we uh, finalize our blend, which is 80% Cabernet Franc and uh, just uh, small parts of Cabernet Sauvignon and Carmener, 10% uh, each, uh, that complete uh, the blend. So uh, the grapes, are, as I was telling you, they are coming from uh, the hilly parts of the estate uh, where the soils are um, more uh, uh, clay ones uh, with sand uh, being uh, uh, a, a, a big part of it. Uh, but on the surface, we do have a lot of, uh, of stones. So um, at the same time, uh, we, have, uh, we have exposures that are uh, facing east to, um, to minimize a bit uh, the, the sun exposure. Uh, so yeah, here in Mortello, we have the, the other way around uh, problem. We are not looking uh, towards uh, the sun because it's, um, yeah. Uh, in this way, we, we do have uh, uh, more elegant expressions and um, yes, that we are looking for uh, for our wines. I, your Carmenere vineyard is very interesting, isn't it? It's the only vineyard of Carmenere in the area, is it? Is yes, right there? Yeah. yes, exactly. In Marema, it's, uh, it's a big uh, peculiarity. I, I mean, in Italy in general, you cannot find it everywhere, but uh, in Marema, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, of unique. Uh, Antinori family, I mean, uh, in Marchese, uh, together with um, uh, Renzo Cotarella, uh, decided to put it in Marema after the, um, the, the big experience that uh, they had in uh, Chile uh, from uh, the estate uh, that Antinori has there, Haras de Pirque. Uh, so they decided to bring it uh, to Italy and put it, uh, plant it in uh, Marema. Um, because uh, the idea was that uh, Carmenere is a really demanding in terms of uh, ripening um, variety. So at Mortele, at Mortele, we did have uh, all the, all the uh, ideal uh, conditions to, to have a really interesting expression. And if we judge from the results, I mean, they, they, uh, they, they had the right uh, idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm dying to taste this one now. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, Pojalenane um, is a really precise wine, as I was telling you, because in the cellar we do have, apart from uh, the, the great selection in the parcel, uh, we do have in the cellar uh, berry selection. Uh, we have a great attention um, and precision that are the most uh, precious tools. Uh, the fermentation and extractions are made in uh, particular uh, steel tanks that they are hanging from the seal and uh, their particular form, um, uh, together with uh, the, the, the use of punching downs, uh, helping us to, to preserve all the quality of the fruit uh, by having the, the maximum extraction uh, in the most uh, gentle way. So uh, all the quality and uh, the varietal expression of the Cabernet Franca is, is there. 
Uh, I am. Um, I love Cabernet Franc because it gives you that sort of herbaceous box tree note that that stands exactly. alone and exactly. always gives it more structure, especially with your warm climate. Um, it offers that that yeah. sort of that sort of more more structure, more finesse, that perception of freshness, even in warmer vintages, doesn't it? Was, I, I lost you a bit. Uh, um, I hope my internet's behaving. I saw an unstable thing a minute ago. I was, uh, I was just saying that it, uh, the Cabernet Franc gives a lovely expression of sort of gives adds structure and a, and a perception of freshness, um, which which is you know very needed in your warm climate. Um, exactly. And I just I think it's it's really it's such an interesting grape variety. Um, and and what it's producing here and the Carmen yeah, as well has that sort of spicy fruit doesn't it so exactly. that's what we're, we're getting and 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 this wine the 17 vintage was quite warm but it doesn't taste overripe does it yes we do have a, a vintage in the glass that it was really warm and dry uh, so resulted into wines that uh, they are really concentrated they have a lot of fruit black fruit and concentration that will give to the wine, uh, without doubt, a, a really a long potential in aging. Uh, but yeah, we, we do have the, uh, the Cabernet Franc uh, character, as you were saying, you, you, you can feel a bit of eucalyptus, a bit of uh, wild mint uh, there, uh, together with the spiciness of Carmenere, as you said. I mean, Carmenere in Mortele, mm, it's amazing. Uh, we did taste Carmener after uh, fermentation uh, before uh, put it in the in the in the barrels uh, that uh, tasted uh, like chocolate. I mean, we have expressions of Carmener that mm, you can feel it in the in the in the um, in the glass even if uh, it's just ten percent. You can totally feel it. Yeah, it's lovely. The complexity of this wine is outstanding, and it is such a baby. It's such a pity to 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 open it so early, but um, but it's it's drinking beautifully now. But I think in seven to ten years, we'll be looking at an amazingly beautiful, elegant wine. Um, okay, I'm going to keep us moving because we're hitting the timing now, um, and I'll try and be good. Uh, we did touch on climate change. Um, and the uh, influences of what was what or what was happening. I think what was interesting when Georgia was talking about um, the, your work with water, because you know we took, spoke about the 2017 vintage and how dry it was and how hot. And these vintages, these extremes, are just going to become more prominent in um, in in viticulture. Um, so, so the fact that you're working with lower densities in the vineyard, less vines, that is, so each vine has a longer stretch to achieve water access than other vines. Um, and also the fact that you're working with cover crops and uh, mulching to contain some of that sacred humidity um, is really important. Are there any other points that you want to add at this point about the sort of climate change and how the Antonori teams are reacting to it? Well, the important thing that we, we do focus uh, in um, minimizing our impact in the environment, which indirectly uh, helps uh, to all that. So um, in, um, in the vineyard as well, uh, apart from the winery that is, as we described, uh, in a sustainable uh, design, in the vineyards, we do have a lot of uh, techniques uh, that they are sustainable. Uh, we have um, a pest, uh, integrated pest management. Uh, so uh, we, we do have a lot of investing a lot uh, on monitoring uh, uh, insects, on um, uh, encouraging predators, uh, on uh, uh, supporting, as we said, a range of, uh, of plants and uh, using pheromones. Uh, so uh, th they are all um, they are all uh, techniques that uh, we choose to to, to follow, uh, both for ethical and uh, technical reasons. Because I mean, the more we work in in harmony with the territory and with our terroir, um, the, the greater expressions we gain for uh, for our wines. Mm, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we've had a couple of questions about um, 
because I think Bordeaux have sort of put it in everyone's mind, the Bordelais and their new varieties. Um, I'm not sure I'm massively excited about trying a Tariga Nationale from Bordeaux. Let's hope that it doesn't come to that. But um, but uh, uh, Luis was asking, would you consider planting other late ripening varieties like Petit Verdo, um, especially with warming climate and low risk of spring frost? So um, what are your thoughts there? So yeah, we do have, uh, as we uh, said, uh, really late, late ripening varieties. I mean, I cannot think uh, anyone uh, more late ripening than Carmener. But yeah, we do have Petit Verdot. We do have Petit Verdot in the in the property, uh, which gives uh, great results. Uh, but uh, for the moment, we are not using it uh, to to our blends. Uh, so uh, yeah, it goes for other wines uh, of uh, of Antinori. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we keep experimenting. I mean, uh, another experiment that is coming to my mind uh, in the vineyards is the late pruning. Um, it's a pruning that you finalize after a bad, bur bad burst uh, so that you can um, reduce uh, sugar accumulation with, uh, without delaying uh, the maturity of uh, phenols. Uh, but yeah, they're all experiments and we're working on it. But I mean, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, tool that we have uh, other than the vineyard is um, blendings in, um, in, uh, in the cellar. So blendings of different parcels, blendings of different uh, harvest dates. So that's what we are trying to do with uh, what we are doing with Vivia. So Vermentino, for example, is, is a local variety really adapted to, to hot uh, weather and dry climates, uh, uh, but lacks in acidity. So what we are doing is uh, harvest a parcel, uh, a part of Vermentino a bit earlier so that we can keep uh, acidity in our blend and another part a, a little bit later so we can have more mature aromas, more ripened aromas, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, more full body uh, Vermentino. Yeah, I think I think that's the point, isn't it? You have you have different altitudes, you have different soils, you have def different expositions. Thank you, thanks to your hilly topography, uh, and you also have your lake, which I love. Yes. I love your lake. I keep looking at your lake, uh, and it's the same for Ricardo. Um, you have lots of choices and opportunities, um, which is. Uh, really fascinating um and as you say it's i i you know gone are the years when the winemaker would go on holiday in august and not worry about his vineyard it would grow itself <laughs> nowadays everyone is watching what is happening and picking early uh picking uh, specific plots at different times to bring elements of freshness you know it's very much a balancing act um because the climate doesn't make it easy at all no. <laughs> Thank you. thanks to climate change so um i don't see any more questions um and i'm gonna uh hopefully my internet isn't being unstable like it's telling me it is um hold on for a few more minutes internet um i just want to thank everyone today for for listening to us um i want to thank you guys the panel for being here and helping arrange this and sending over samples of the new vintages and just um i just the insight we got from ricardo and georgia was fantastic and obviously filippo brings the glamour as does chiara uh so you know thank you so much guys um and i want to thank our customers for uh coming and listening and being interested in wine because as a company that's what we're all about is knowledge and learning more and more about wine. We love it. Um, and, you know, the more you learn, the more you enjoy it, especially at the moment where a lot of us are probably down a little bit of wine waiting for this lockdown to end and for light to come at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think this morning hopefully has cheered you all up. It's cheered me up anyway. It's reminded me why we're here and what we love about wine. Um, I love the Antonori family story. I love the fact it's a family. I love the fact it's all about innovation. Um, Piero leads from the front, but his three daughters 
are very much involved now. And I like the fact that there's a real feminine in influence coming in here. Um, and it's great to have Georgia here as a, a, a female winemaker. I'm um, sorry, Ricardo, obviously you're great as well, but you know, the more of you. And I just, I, you know, what I hadn't really appreciated with Cortona was the similarities with the Northern Rhone. Um, and I didn't realize that Poggio Alanana means hill of the wild ducks. I think that's great. That's now my favorite sort of saying of the day. Um, and and our insights, Georgia, you're brilliant with your um, your sort of climate change uh, and your work there and explaining it. Thank you for that, because it's really fascinating for all of us. Um, Jeff and all the team who got the samples ready. Amazing. Brilliant. Uh, May I say one thing? No, I, I was <laughs> of course you can, Felipe. Thank you, thank you personally for the great job you have done in yeah. organizing uh, such a wonderful tasting. I also thank all of the participants. I very much hope they like the wines. I also take the opportunity to thank uh, Georgia and uh, and Ricardo. They did a splendid job. It was an occasion for me to learn more, by the way, because sometimes <laughs> enologists keep uh, secrets and sometimes piece, bit by bit they... they you release. have to pay to have them. I know, <laughs> yeah. the problem. that is the problem, so I don't pay, I don't get new information. Yeah. So I repeat always the same old story of 20 years ago, but time changes. So, so but, in, but in any case... Uh, Thank you very much, Ariet. Thank you very much for having, having managed to gather such, uh, let's say, many important customers and uh, uh, let's say wine, uh, wine passionate people around us today. And we all very much hope to get these people here at Antinori visiting our estates. One of these, uh, let's say, uh, COVID uh, pandemic will have gone. Mm. Uh, the sooner the better. I, 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 I'm so with you there. Yeah. I'm so with you there, Filippo. Yeah, yeah. The sooner the better we can get into normal yeah. life. Um, yeah. and, and, and thank you all again. Um, and, and, and I just, uh, I, I just, I, I, I've just remembered one point, Georgia, you made about your competition being Guado Altasso. And I'm very competitive <laughs> and I'm with you on that. But I think you've got you've got a winner here because you have Cabernet Franc. And that's, you know, I think that is the great of the future with climate change and with its structure and its lovely acidity. So so yes. move over Guado El Tasso. Loma Tale is on the way. Um, um, this yeah. is not be heard by Marco Ferrarese. He won't be yeah. happy. No, well, it's okay. It's all right. We're, we're, we're going for your team. Um, even though they're both delicious wines and very different. But, uh, but, um, but no, and just a little bit of housekeeping, guys. If anyone's on Instagram, um, I'm going to be talking to Ross Lewis tonight on um, trade talks uh, and we're just going to talk about Ross and his amazing mentorship and his life in um, in the restaurant business it's at, on the Tyndall channel at uh, six o'clock tonight um, and it won't go on okay, for an hour great. and a half yeah great. and we'll have a glass of Antonori while we're talking I, mean, I hope so yeah we will we will you that's all I drink, Filippo. I mean, you yeah, know, no, it's... No, no, yeah. <laughs> this is well known amongst master of wine. You are the first master of wine title, so it's yeah. unbelievable. An incredible achievement. Oh, well, well, thank you, Filippo. And thank you all again. And I'm going to end it now so people can go about their day on this. You have your sunshine, we have our rain, but we now have a lovely array of wines to think about. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Nice. Bye-bye-bye.